Friends. Reptiles. People desperately making sewing puns on threads. My name's Ash, my homosexual audacity has led me to believe I can do basically any textile related craft, and I hear you either have, or are about to, impulse purchase a spinning wheel. There's been a steady rise in interest in the ancient art of spinning, and as someone who's been casually turning improbable substances into yarn for years, and helped a few people get started in the hobby, let's talk you through the basics and a bit of the history. In this video we're going to cover what equipment is available, including but not limited to spinning wheels, and how you choose what you want. A brief introduction to different kinds of fibre and fibre preparation, a short basic lesson in spinning itself, and some ideas for how you start levelling up once you've got the hang of the basics. There's a lot of information in this video and it might get a little overwhelming, so I'll make sure to put chapters in. Please do use these liberally to skip to the bit that you want. But we're going to start at the beginning. You want to start spinning. What do you do? So before you go out and impulse purchase the first spinning wheel on eBay you find, yeah I know you were looking, let's talk drop spindles. Before the invention of the spinning wheel, for thousands of years, the primary way of spinning yarn was with one of these. Well, this is a modern example of a drop spindle. The basic principle is the same all throughout history, and indeed all over the world. The specifics end up looking and behaving a bit different, but this broad method of spinning has been used worldwide since before recorded history began. Spindles are usually wood, but in many places spindle walls, this bit, were made out of stone, clay, bone, glass, or other materials that survive in the archaeological record. And we have millions! There are also many cultures today who still use drop spindles as their primary form of spinning. Drop spindles aren't hard to make, you can use almost any materials you want. Most people watching this could make one fairly trivially out of stuff you have around the house. It's got harder now, CDs are basically obsolete, but that was the go-to improvised spindle wall for a long time. I would argue this is not only one of the simplest, but also one of the oldest pieces of technology still in use. There's something magical about setting one of these spinning and knowing that you're doing almost exactly what millions of humans have done for thousands of years before you. But they're not sexy like spinning wheels, I get that. If you want to get started in spinning, I do think the best option is to pick up a drop spindle. You might not like it very much, I didn't for years, but you can learn how to draft and manage twist at a much slower and more user-friendly speed, and without having to also learn how to manage a wheel. If you start with one of these, you'll get a pretty good idea of whether you are seriously interested in spinning without the huge outlay on a wheel. But also if you are are serious about spinning, you will be so much better when you do make the step up to a wheel. It's like learning to drive an automatic so you get used to the rules of the road before going on to a manual and having to shift gears as well as being aware of other road users, your speed and all the signs. For the record here in the UK they just throw us in at the deep end with cars so like if you want to skip straight to the wheel you can do that, I can't stop you, I'm not your real dad. There's a bunch of different kinds of drop spindle and honestly none of them are especially easier or harder. If you want to do a specific historical period, it's worth looking into what exactly we think they would have had, but the most common kinds you're going to encounter in the English-speaking world are a top wall or a bottom wall drop spindle. I find top walls a little easier to manage, but that may well just be that's what I have the most experience with. Side note about spinning, people will tell you a certain kind of equipment is easier or more beginner-friendly, and it's often worth checking that that isn't just whatever they personally started with. Spinners often prefer the equipment they have the most experience with. A lot of people's favourite kind of wheel is their first wheel. Okay, so enough lead-in, let's talk about wheels. Spinning wheels have been around in one form or another for about a thousand years. There's a lot of argument over the specifics. They don't reach Europe until sometime around the end of the 13th century. Just another revolutionary development we can thank the Islamic world for either inventing or introducing us to. Which isn't to say that this kind of wheel is 800 years old, quite the opposite in fact. Things like the foot pedal to drive the wheel are relatively new inventions. If you want a medieval spin wheel, it's a great wheel turned by hand with a great big spike of a spindle instead of a bobbin and flyer. Yes, the kind of thing you could stab yourself with if a certain fairy had it in for you. For the purposes of this video I'm not going to get over much into historical wheels and instead concentrate on what you can buy now. Which leads me directly to my first point, don't buy an antique wheel. That's not to say you can't get a second hand or even a vintage wheel, but if you're going to do that, or you want a working antique, you want to look for a specialist 
market, like a spinner's Facebook group or something. If you're going to get a pre-owned wheel as a beginner spinner, get it from someone who's experienced enough to tell you that it works and they've spun on it. It's really tempting to pick up a super cheap, super beautiful antique wheel off eBay that's being sold as a decoration, but you have no guarantee that it spins at all, let alone evenly. It almost certainly doesn't have all the pieces. You don't know it isn't damaged or warped. These are not hundred year old cast iron singer sewing machines. These babies are wood. If that wheel hasn't been kept in a dry, temperature-controlled environment and varnished or waxed properly, she's gonna bend, she's gonna crack, she's gonna be eaten by insects, she's gonna rot. And unlike sewing machines, there's no service shop you can take your wheel into to get it looked at. You're largely on your own, so don't buy a wheel you aren't certain is in full working order until you're very experienced and uh, looking to get into carpentry. It's okay to want a restoration project, but that that is what you're getting with an unknown antique wheel, not an intro to spinning. As an extra discouragement, you won't be able to easily get extra parts. Most people think this means repairs if the wheel gets broken, but it's so much more than that. I'm a not very prolific spinner and just three bobbins sometimes feels like a bit of a constraint. An antique wheel might only come with one or none, and these are not standardized. <laughs> you can't swap bobbins between wheels the way you can with sewing machines. With antique wheels, the only option Option if you need another bobbin is to get a woodworker to make you one and hope they're good enough at wood turning to exactly match the dimensions. Just trust me, first wheel, get a second hand wheel from a spinner who can confirm it works or get a new one. And either way, do your research and look for a reputable brand that is ideally still trading or prolific enough in the second hand market. So what options do you have when picking a wheel? First and most obvious, modern wheels come in two main styles, upright or castle wheels like this one here, or offset or Saxony wheels. The difference is that, hang on, I'm about to use a whole bunch of words you don't know yet. Let's talk key parts of a spinning wheel very quickly. This guy is the drive wheel. The drive wheel is connected to the treadle or treadles plural. We'll get to that. By the footman, which is this bit back here. The treadle is how you turn the wheel with your foot. Around the drive wheel goes the drive band, either once or twice. We'll get to that, and goes up to the flyer, which holds and distributes the yarn to the bobbin, which collects the yarn you spun as you go along. The yarn enters the flyer through the orifice, more on that later, and the whole setup here is supported by the maidens, which sit upright from the mother of all. Promise I am not making these names up, you'll get used to it. In an upright wheel, the mother of all sits above the drive wheel. Because the orifice has to be at a comfortable height, that means that the upright drive wheel can only be about this big. That makes it very convenient to store and move, at least by the standards of spinning wheels, but it does mean that the wheel to bobbin ratio is smaller. A smaller drive wheel has to do more work and has less inertia, which most people find means treadling is more of a workout. It's harder to turn the wheel and keep it turning, but also easier to stop it. It's worth noting though that entry level Saxony wheels have drive wheels of about the same size. You have to spend a lot to get a significantly bigger drive wheel. It's just that in a Saxony wheel where the mother of all sits to one side, the orifice can stay at a comfortable height and the drive wheel can get pretty damn big. Saxony wheels are very hashtag aesthetic, but they also take up a lot of space and can be much more expensive. They do have the benefit that if you wanted to disconnect the footman, you then have what is essentially a great wheel, the style of wheel that predates both of these kinds, where you turn the wheel with your hand and spin one-handed. If you're into medieval, renaissance, or even early modern history, historical impressions, that might be a real bonus to you. Let's talk about those bits I said I'd get back to. All of the options I'm about to talk about exist with both styles of wheel. Depending on what brands are available in your country, you can kinda mix and match to get what you want. Kinda. Treadles. This wheel is a double treadle wheel, so you use both feet to drive it. This is significantly less common than the single treadle, where you just have one pedal and you use one foot. There are benefits to both styles. The single treadle is, I think, a bit fussier than a double treadle, as you have to press your foot at the right moment in the wheel's rotation to keep it going, which I never really got on with because I have no rhythm. And I like being able to distribute the work between both legs. But I know a fair few people who find the double treadle harder on their joints and like the single treadle specifically because they can use just one leg at a time and swap between feet when one gets tired. Double treadles also end up a little more expensive on average. Drive band. You have two options here, double drive or single drive. Don't get those confused with double 
double or single treadles. It's completely different, because that's helpful. A double drive goes twice around the drive wheel. One loop goes here and turns the flyer, and the other loop goes around the bobbin here. What this does is make sure that the flyer and the bobbin turn at the same speed, and the bobbin doesn't just spin however it wants. Because the bobbin isn't actually attached to the flyer. Oh yeah, this whole bit just comes off. No biggie. A single drive just goes around the flyer and the drive wheel once. So what do we do about the bobbin? Well, you have this extra little doohickey here, which is called a scotch tension. That basically puts a brake on the bobbin so it doesn't spin wildly out of control. And you can adjust it very easily. Which one of these you want is very much a personal choice again. Single drive gives you a lot more control and fine adjustment and tension. Double drive gives you, in my opinion, fewer opportunities to screw it up. The good news is that for this, there's quite a few wheels that can be either. I have this guy set up as a double drive as standard, but if I wanted to put a new drive band on it because it has a scotch tension mechanism, I could have a single drive, no sweat. This is probably a good time to talk about ratios. The ratio on your wheel measures how many times the flyer will rotate if you make one full rotation of the drive wheel. It's normally expressed as something like 7 to 1 or 10 to 1. A fast wheel has a high ratio, but high ratios are not automatically better. Now you have to think about what kind of yarn you want to spin. Lower ratios are better for thicker yarns, while higher ratios are better for thinner yarns. If you want to do a lot of fancy art yarn with inclusions and spicy bits, you want a low ratio. Super fine lace weight, higher ratio. Which isn't to say you need a specific ratio to do that, you're just going to find it helps it along a bit. The good news is that a lot of modern wheels will let you change up the ratio, either by changing the flyer wall, this bit, or by changing the bobbins if you have a double drive. The bobbins on my wheel are double-ended, so you can choose a smaller ratio or a larger ratio. This kind of thing is more and more common the newer your wheel is, as people would in general rather get more accessories for the wheel they already own than buy a whole new wheel if they want to do something a bit different. Obviously if you have a small drive wheel your ratios can only go so high. Saxony wheels with huge drive wheels generally have a range of ratios much higher than what I get on this little guy, just because the drive wheel is so much bigger than the bobbin. That leads us to the orifice. Yeah, there's no way to make that sentence sound good. So the orifice also dictates how thick a yarn you can make, but in a much more obvious way. If the yarn won't fit through this hole, it's not going to become yarn. If you do find you want to make crazy art yarn, some wheels have special jumbo flyers that you can buy, so you can just swap out this bit for a bigger one. Bigger hooks, bigger orifice. I have never felt the need, but I am surprisingly pedestrian in my yarn making. There are even flyers that don't have an orifice, Orifice as such, they just have a hook. Those are great for absolutely massive yarns. Other features that this wheel has that may or may not be of interest to you. My wheel has a built-in lazy kate. I swear I'm not making these names up. This is storage for my other two bobbins, but also because they spin freely, I can use it to hold four bobbins while I'm plying, which is spinning two yarns together to make a thicker yarn. This is pretty rare. For most wheels, you're looking at picking up a separate lazy kate or just chucking your bobbins in a basket. That's valid. It also has a hole to put your orifice hook in. If your wheel doesn't come with an orifice hook, uh, get one. They're really cheap and they do their job really well. Threading yarn through the orifice is the fiddliest thing in the world. Just get a hook. Finally, my wheel has space for you to put a distaff. Historically, distaffs were used a lot for basically all fibers and antique distaffs are both beautiful and huge. No, really huge, a big old stick that you could conceivably beat a man with. If you start looking into written records, it's surprising how often that comes up. The distaff is used to hold the raw fibers while you're spinning. With early drop spindles, I'm talking the Romans, the distaff is normally held against the body by the arm and is fairly reasonable in size. With a later drop spindle or an early wheel, so medieval and onwards, the distaff is much bigger and would usually be put through the back of your belt and held in the crook of your elbow. Elbow. When the wheel becomes more predominant, gradually we shift to this setup where the distaff can be directly attached to the wheel itself. While people do still use distaffs for wool sometimes, since at least the Victorians, if not a bit earlier, distaffs are only really used for flax or linen. That's the reason why my wheel has a spot for it but not an included distaff. You're probably only getting one if you're spinning flax, and it's an Eastern European wheel so you might be spinning flax. It survived barely as a craft in Eastern Europe in a way that it just hasn't in Western Europe, where I live, but you're still probably not spinning flax. I also want to mention that distaffs have a strong folklore
folkloric and magical history. They are often associated with witches, goddesses, and general feminine rowdiness. And there are depictions of distaffs as magical tools and as symbols of power, as well as big sticks to beat men with. There's a lot of unsubstantiated and slightly overblown claims around this subject on the internet, so it's a bit hard to get more specific than that without a heck ton of research. But the evidence does seem to suggest that the distaff was an object exclusively associated with women, which is not as true of spinning wheels. Certainly into the 17th and 18th century, there seems to be a lot of evidence to say that there are plenty of men spinning as their profession, or indeed any other textile related equipment that I'm aware of. Everything from knitting to weaving to dyeing to sewing has been a male dominated trade and in Europe at some point, and nothing seems to have had quite the symbolic impact or the exclusively feminine association of the distaff might explain why I don't have one. Now there's one thing I've not really talked about yet, and that is electric spinning machines. E-spinners you can buy and just have in your house are getting more common. There are some pretty inexpensive options out there, and because they replace all of the wheel and everything with an electric motor, are pretty compact. If space or physical ability is an issue, they're a really great choice. I don't have one, so I can't offer a lot of specific advice, but they generally have a pretty good reputation, and that's absolutely not Option that's available to you. People outside the spinning community have sometimes mentioned to me that they think e-spinners don't count somehow, and I want to be clear that that kind of snobbery is really rare within the hobby itself. Spinners don't really care what you use, all kinds of spinning are welcomed, and a lot of spinners find that as they get older, an e-spinner is a great accommodation. There's a couple more accessories that, if you are getting into spinning, it's a pretty good idea to have around. The first I think is actually kind of essential. I really struggled until I got mine. And it's this thing, which is called a Niddy Noddy. Yes, the Niddy Noddy lets you turn the bobbin full of yarn into a nice even skein of yarn, which you need to do as part of the process. I'll explain more about that later on in the video and show you how you use it. And there's not really a good way of doing that without one. You can also get different sizes, so if you're only spinning small amounts of yarn, you might want a little one like this. This is a one meter Niddy Noddy. Or you can get a big boy. I have misplaced mine. I'm not sure how. It's gone missing somewhere. I've also seen people make these from scratch and plumbing parts, but they're not that expensive. If you don't have plumbing parts laying around, it's probably going to work out about the same to just buy one. Finally, you might want to get into fibre tools more generally. You might decide what you want to do is just buy fibre that's ready to spin, which is completely fine. But if you want to do some processing yourself, you're going to need some extra hardware. There's basically two ways of preparing fibres to be ready to spin, combing or carding. Some fibres don't like carding, but a lot of them, wool in particular, are happy with either, giving you slightly different results. If you want to go with combing, you can either get yourself a hackle, which is a very historical and vaguely terrifying spiky thing, or a set of dedicated wool combs, two terrifying spiky things, or uh dog combs, which kind of work and are a lot cheaper, and you can just get them from the pet shop. You might also, if you want to do a lot of combing, look at getting or making a diz, which is a thing with a hole in it. Yes, you can just make one out of like a yoghurt pot or a Tupperware lid. That you pull the fibres through once they're combed, so they all kind of bind together, and it gives you a long sausage of fibre, which is called tops. Combed fibres end up being very smooth and sleek, and that translates to the yarn that you spin. Carding, on the other hand, is, in my opinion, a lot easier and introduces a lot more of what's called loft, which is basically how fluffy and airy the fibre is. A pair of hand carders are not cheap, but they're very quick and easy to use compared to the combs. Hand carders give you these sausages of fibre that are called Rolex. You can also, if you're willing to shell out the price of a basic spinning wheel, get a drum carder, which mechanises a lot of the process and gives you these big fat slabs of fibre, which are called bats. Carding machines, on the other hand, are out of reach of most humans, but you can buy the results. A long sausage, very similar to tops, but this is called roving. If you've ever wondered while browsing fibres what the difference between tops and roving is, now you know. It's kind of like the difference between custard and pavlova. Same ingredients, different processing. That's the equipment pretty much covered, so let's carry on talking about fibre. Obviously, you can't spin without fibre, and if you go shopping online you'll find a dizzying array of options. I've spun with everything from yak hair, to kevlar, to nettle fibre, to recycled plastic bottles. There are both specialist shops and indie creators that will sell you ready processed fibre that you just take out of the bag and start spinning with. So you don't need to worry about more complicated 
complicated fibre preparation unless you actually want to. Unless you spent a lot of money on a very specialised wheel, you can spin almost any fibre on almost any generic wheel. Your wheel might be marginally better suited to certain kinds, but largely the adaptation is going to come from you, the spinner. I've had people who thought they needed to get a special kind of wheel because they're vegan and don't want to use animal fibres. And that's just not really how it works. The wheel doesn't care. The wheel will just do its thing. You need to be able to adapt yourself to the change in the fibre you're using. Having said that, some fibres are easier for beginners. Fibre has three main qualities that we look at. Staple, which is the length of the fibres. Crimp, which is how wiggly they are. And micron, which is how thick each fibre is. If you're just starting out, you are going to have an easier time spinning with fibres that are kind of in the middle of all those scales. Medium to medium long staple, medium to medium low crimp, not too fine or too coarse. Let's talk about the different categories of fibre you're likely to encounter. I'm going to cover sheep's wool, other wools, hair, silk, flax, cotton, other plant fibres and synthetics. But this is not an exhaustive list. If it's fibre, you can spin it. Wool you can try. The first is wool, specifically sheep's wool. If you're shopping for fibre, you'll find you can buy a dizzying array of wools specifying by colour, breed of sheep, staple length, crimp level, etc. A significant proportion of that is going to be merino. Merino has the longest staple and lowest crimp of readily available sheep's wools. So it's a little bit more challenging than some other wools, but still not a terrible choice for a beginner if you really don't like slightly coarser wools. If you're looking for the absolute easiest option, medium staple breeds like Corridale, Blueface Leicester, Jacob or Romney are all great options. I would recommend as a beginner, at least for your first few projects, avoiding Wensleydale or other sheep breeds whose wool is sold in locks. These have so much crimp, the sheep look like they have ringlets. And that's quite a bit more challenging. Then there's the other animals that have wool, and this is a big list, including but not limited to alpacas, llamas, camels, angora rabbits, some goats, yaks, and a bunch more that are rare but not unheard of. These all have their own qualities, but a general rule of thumb is that they normally have a shorter staple and less crimp than sheep's wool, making them slightly more challenging. Angora, in particular, I don't recommend for a first project. It's pretty silky and short, but alpaca is quite forgiving and very popular for how soft it is. That moves us on to hair, which is a hell of a category. When we describe an animal hair as opposed to an animal wool, it's thicker, smoother, and generally doesn't have much or any crimp. And that makes it very challenging to spin because because the fibres slide over each other easily and don't want to mesh. Many animals, like camels, have both wool and hair, and cashmere and mohair are hair fibres. So you can get these for spinning. But the hair category often ends up being also uh, naturally found fibres. People want to spin their pet's hair or their own hair. Dog and cat hair is very short staple, even the long hair breeds. Horse hair is slippery and coarse, and human hair is pretty variable. Actually, like, depending on your hair type, Ugh. Look, spinning with human hair is just vaguely unsettling and not very practical. I don't recommend spinning hair in general, but especially not if you're a beginner. Finally, in the animal category, we have silk, which normally means the cocoon of a domestic silk moth larvae, but can in very rare cases be other non-mammalian based fibres. It's a kind of silk that comes from clams. You'll probably never see it, but it exists. Silk is impossibly fine, has virtually no crimp and an incredibly long stay Whereas merino is considered a long staple fibre at 6 to 10 centimetres, if you unravel a single silkworm cocoon as an unbroken thread, it's somewhere in the region of 800 metres long. The processed silk fibre you get to spin with will be considerably less than that, but a couple of metres still isn't uncommon. Hand spinning with silk is a real challenge and definitely something you want to work up to, but it is possible and so worth it. On the plant side of things, there's usually much less variety and offer. A lot of vegan hand spinners, unfortunately, end up working mostly in synthetics. But the main two are flax, which becomes linen, and cotton. Both of these are challenging. 
Flax has a long staple, usually one to two meters, and is both very fine and very straight. It comes from the flax plant through a pretty intensive and time consuming process. And it's not the easiest thing to spin, but I would say it's doable for a beginner if you know that you have to ignore basically all the spinning advice that's for wool. Look up guides on specifically spinning flax and you'll find all kinds of weird hints that are counterintuitive to spinning with any kind of animal fiber. Like that if you want smooth linen threads, you want to spin with wet fingers. But the results are beautiful and the long strong staple is actually pretty forgiving. Cotton can sod off. Cotton can actually be a lot of different plants in the same family, and if you get, for example, Egyptian cotton fibre, it's not as bad as all the others. But cotton has a very short staple, and although I said that these guys are multitaskers, and that's true, this kind of spinning wheel is not designed for cotton. Cotton is the outlier. If you look at spinning wheels from India, which were invented specifically for cotton, they look completely different. It's possible to spin cotton by hand on one of these. I've done it. It's really hard and very frustrating. I don't recommend it. There are some other more niche plant fibers that you'll come across occasionally, and they mostly tend to be in the flax style. So plants with long, strong stems full of what's called bast fibers, which are extracted through a fairly lengthy process. But they're all a bit rare for one reason or another. Nettle is a particularly European one that gets overlooked a lot because it's just not as good as flax and hurts you when you try and harvest it. The fiber will not sting you. Ramier is the East Asian flax equivalent, which is pretty common there, but doesn't get seen much in the West because we grow flax, and hemp has historical and ongoing constraints around growing it. But wait, Ash, what about bamboo? <sighs> Okay kids, let's talk about synthetics. In spinning and shopping for fibre you will run into a lot of plant fibres that seem unlikely. Bamboo is by far and away the most common, but I've seen rose, mint, seaweed, eucalyptus, pine tree. These plants don't have their own fibres. These fibres are rayon. Rayon is a synthetic cellulose-based fibre, originally mostly from wood, whereby you chemically break down plant matter and then extract the cellulose in long strands. It behaves very much like plant fibre. It will buy biodegrade, but it's man-made. I personally take issue with the fact that these are presented as a sustainable option because they aren't plastic, and ostensibly come from waste or naturally occurring sources, when the process of making them is so toxic to both the environment and workers, it's generally not considered cost-effective to do so within the European Union, where, you know, there are laws about that sort of thing. But having said that, they're beautiful and really easy to spin with, and if you're vegan and just starting out, yeah, bamboo is a great option. It's cheap and very forgiving and behaves a lot like merino. You can dye it, it's lovely to wear, just don't believe every Everything you read about it. It's also not antimicrobial in fiber or yarn form, okay? No one's proved that ever. The data isn't there. The ones that seem to say it is, they're all looking at untreated raw material. Let's just put that to bed. It's either not a thing or so incredibly minimal it won't make a difference. As well as rayons, viscose, tensile, modal, whatever you want to call them, they're all broadly the same thing, that are actually branded as such, you can also get spinning fibers that are more traditional plastic-based synthetics. But they're fairly rare. Generally these are presented as a novelty option, so if you want sparkly tinsel in your yarn, or as very functional extras. You can get nylon if you want to blend your own nylon merino sock yarn for strength, for example. I don't have a lot of experience with synthetics. There was that one time I tried spinning with Kevlar, but in general they're quite user-friendly. After all, they were specifically engineered to be. One final synthetic you do occasionally see popping up in spinning fibres that I've not really seen anywhere else is synthetic protein fibres. Same basic idea as rayon, but instead of plant matter, it's animal matter. That sounds kind of grim. Milk. It's normally milk. In case you hadn't picked up yet, you get a much bigger and weirder variety of fibres in spinning than you do in, for example, fabric. Something to do with economies of scale, I'm sure. And you're almost guaranteed to run into fibres you've never heard of and didn't know existed because your supplier picked up 10 kilos of South American miniature wild apaca wool that one time. It was £50 for 100 grams of vicuña, and I still regret not getting any. 
All right, we've talked about equipment, we've talked about supplies, time to start spinning. Spinning is fundamentally just three steps. Building up the twist, thinning out the fibre, which is called drafting, and then letting the twist travel up the drafted fibre. You can mess around with all three of those steps, but if you want to turn fibre into yarn, those three things need to happen. I'm going to start by showing you a drop spindle, and then we'll go onto the wheel. This bit is very difficult to describe and very visual, so if you've been listening to the video and paying attention to something else, I, I need you to come back. This section isn't going to make a lot of sense. Please look at the screen. Firstly, you need a bit of yarn. You don't have to do this. You can start by twisting a bit of yarn from your fibre by hand, but it makes life a lot easier to use a scrap. This is called the leader, and it's just a loop that you're going to attach to the spindle like so and put around the hook. The drop spindle should be able to spin freely. If it can't, you might need a longer leader. And then you have your prepared fibre ready to go. To start off with, I'm going to go really slow, one step at a time, like you would as a beginner. First, we build up the twist by spinning the drop spindle. Hold the top of the leader firmly and don't let go of it while you spin. Getting it spinning pretty aggressively takes a bit of practice. Some people do it with a snapping motion like this. You can also roll it against your thigh. Just let it spin until it loses momentum and looks like it's going to start spinning back on itself. And stop it there. You can catch it, you can trap it between your knees, or if it's in reach, you can just sit it on the floor. You can see that the leader here is very twisted, much more twisted than you'd want your yarn to be. That's good. Now we're going to draft. Drafting is just pulling the fibres apart until they're thin enough for the yarn you want, but overlapping enough that the yarn doesn't break. The theory is easy. Hold the fibre in both hands and pull them apart until the fibres separate. In practice, well, this takes practice. One hand is going to stay anchored firmly here at the top of the twisted section. The other is going to hold the fibre a bit further along. If you find you can't pull the fibres apart, move that hand back. If you find the fibre is thinning far away from your front hand and leaving a big clump, move that hand forward. Gently and slowly pull away from you with your front hand. When you're happy with what you've drafted, let go. Look how the twist has travelled up the yarn and stopped where the fibre is thicker. Then you pinch the front hand at the top of the twist and draft again and again and again until you have run out of room to work. Your arms are only so long, so at some point you won't be able to draft any more yarn. At which point, still holding where the yarn meets the fibre, you grab the spindle, unhook and wind it up. Hook it back on and you're ready to go again. Now, how do you know that you're happy with what you've drafted? Practice. Your first several dozens of metres of yarn are going to be pretty terrible. And once you've made the yarn, that's kind of it. You can't really recycle or redo this process. If your yarn is terrible, you now have terrible yarn. But the next yarn will be better, and the next, and the next. In short, what I'm saying is, you may be tempted to buy fancy, brightly coloured, expensive fibres very early on. If you have a tendency to save the nice stuff until you can do it justice, or you're going to be sad about messing up the nice fibre you got specially, just buy grey Corridale until you're confident. On the other hand, if you are incentivized to practice by buying nice fibre and you don't mind that the yarn you make from it is going to suck, go for it. The other thing you're probably wondering is what to do if the yarn breaks. This happens a lot and it's always a bit dramatic. The spindle hits the floor, the end of your yarn flies out of your hand and disappears into your wheel. It's not a problem. Find your end, give yourself an inch or two of room on this side. You probably want to retwist this section, but let this end untwist itself. You might even thin it out a bit. Then draft a little thin wisp off the end of your fibre, overlap them, let the twist travel up, and voila, like it never happened. Well, actually, there's normally a slightly thicker part, but it's really not a problem. With practice, it'll become almost indistinguishable. Now, you can spin like this, what's sometimes called the park and draft method, twist, stop, draft, wind, twist. That's fine. You'll make yarn. You are spinning. It's just slow. If you want to go more quickly, which is a good idea if you're looking to move up to a wheel, you have to draft and twist at the same time. Set the spindle spinning and start drafting. You're doing all the same things as before, just all at once. And yes, you do still need to keep an eye out for your spindle starting to spin backwards while you're drafting. And when your spindle stops or you run out of room, wind the yarn on, go again. If you've got pretty good at spinning park and draft and you're just starting to spin continuously, uh, you're gonna suck again. <laughs> you'll be back to making terrible yarn and you'll almost certainly find your yarn breaks a lot more often. It's frustrating, but normal. Again, you just have to keep practicing. Ready for the wheel? Let's take a look. So here, the specifics might differ depending on your exact wheel setup. So when in doubt, consult the instructions that came with your wheel or look it up online. Most companies have a YouTube these days. You're going to put your bobbin into your flyer and attach the wall. Check your bobbin spins freely. 
insert it into the wheel, attach the drive band, and then attach the leader to the bobbin. We're using a leader again, and you probably want this to be a good bit longer than the leader you used with your drop spindle. I usually find if it, you leave it just like this, it spins about the bobbin, doesn't want to take up the yarn. A couple of wraps around takes care of that. Go around one of the hooks on the flyer, through the orifice. Now, you're going to want to test your tension. Set the wheel going with your hand and start treadling. It might take you a bit of practice before you can do this easily. Don't be afraid to practice with no yarn at all until you're feeling more confident. Hold your leader while you treadle. You're looking for the yarn to twist together evenly and get pulled into the orifice at a steady, comfortable rate. If it's not being taken up by the bobbin, you need to increase the tension. If it's being pulled out of your hand, you need to lower it. There's usually a nice big wooden handle for adjusting the tension. You can always stop the wheel, pull the leader back out again, and start over to check whether you're happier with your new setting. Once you're happy with how the yarn is behaving, it's time to introduce the fiber, and this is going to work exactly the same as continuously spinning on the drop spindle. Spin the wheel and start drafting. Unlike the drop spindle, you don't have to stop every time you run out of working space because the wheel will take up the yarn as you spin it. You'll still need to stop and start every now and again to move the yarn along the hooks of the flyer as the bobbin starts to fill up so that it fills evenly and you can get the maximum amount of yarn on to the bobbin. But overall, this is a much faster and more continuous spinning experience. You can also, if you're feeling brave, introduce a long draw to your drafting. So far we've been drafting with what's called a short draw, or the inchworm, pulling forwards on the fibres. You can see that front hand only has so far it can go. With the speed of a wheel, you can instead draw backwards with your back hand. This does take some confidence and finesse, and honestly, still not great at it, and I've been spinning for years. And neither is better than the other, you may just find that one is more comfortable for your arms and hands. So it's worth trying the long draw at some point, even if you decide you actually prefer short draw. And that's spinning! You just keep doing that until your bobbin is full, or your spindle is getting unmanageable, or you run out of fibre. Let's go over how you finish this off. At this point, I wind the tail end of the yarn onto the bobbin. Wool is sticky enough that if I just smooth it down, it'll stay. And I usually let the yarn rest overnight. I'm not actually convinced this makes a difference and may just be superstition, but received spinning wisdom is you let the yarn rest. With a drop spindle, you can just slide it off if you want to keep spinning. With a wheel, you swap out the bobbin. Then the next day, probably, maybe longer, it's time to get this boy out. It's our friend, the improbably named Niddy Noddy, and we're going to wind this yarn into a skein. The ends of the Niddy Noddy should be at right angles to each other, in case your twists for storage like many of them do. This is to maximise the length of yarn that you can wind, given that human arms are a pretty fixed length themselves. Hold the Niddy Noddy in the middle, trap the end of the yarn there too, and then you don't move this hand until you're done. When you have wound everything, tie the ends of the yarn together. You might lose a bit of your yarn, it's annoying, but it's not that long a piece in the grand scheme of things. Best practice is to then add some figure eight ties. Grab a scrap piece of yarn, stick a finger through the skein, weave both ends through, and tie them in a knot, enclosing the whole skein. You can do this more than once in each place and can do several spaced around the skein. Do I do this every time? No, because I'm lazy. Be better than me. Because these are going to help prevent your skein from getting all messed up and tangled when it goes for a bath. Which is what we're doing next. You need to get the yarn totally saturated with water. This isn't a fancy step, but be aware that if you're spinning with wool, you don't want to felt your skein together, so no big temperature changes, minimal agitation. I tend to just fill a sink with cold to lukewarm water and hold it under not much movement with both hands for like a minute or two, like someone I don't like very much. Once it's fully saturated, take it out, squeeze out some of the water, gently. You don't want to wring it because it will felt, but you want to get as much out as you can, because the next thing is to hold both ends of the loop and give it a firm snap. That's going to help stop your yarn from curling up on itself when you try and use it. And if your yarn is really wet, it's going to spray water everywhere, so do it in the bathroom not the living room. If you're using a really delicate or short staple fibre, that might be a more gentle snap, or maybe just a light tug, but for wool, you can be a bit aggressive, it can take it. I usually fold the skein into a towel and give it a gentle press to get even more of the water out before I hang it up or lay it out to dry. 
Now, some people put a weight on the end of their skein here. I don't like that. I think it stretches the yarn out and destroys a lot of the character, but it's a personal choice. I don't tend to overspin a lot, which is the main thing people are trying to counteract with that. Once the yarn is dry, that's it. You can now use your yarn for whatever you use yarn for. You're done. You made a yarn. <laughs> So why is this video still going? Well, there's a couple of other things you might want to do that I'm not going into massive detail about, but if you're happy with your spinning and are looking to level up, here's some avenues you can research. If there's a lot of interest, I might even make a couple more videos in future. Don't hold me to that. I've made a lot of promises. So let's get nerdy. Your wheel or spindle can spin in two different directions. This does affect the quality of your yarn. We call that S or Z twist. Does it matter? Not really, but also kinda. If you're planning on plying your yarn, you're going to want to ply in the other direction to how you originally spun it. If you use yarn, a lot of the yarn you'll have handled is plied. Two or more threads twisted together. If you've got the hang of spinning fine, even yarn singles and want something chunkier, you can ply your yarn. There's two main ways of doing this. The one you're probably most used to is just having two bobbins of yarn and twisting them together in the opposite direction to how they were originally twisted. There's also chain plying, which is essentially long crochet while spinning if you have a single bobbin of yarn and want to ply it. S or Z twist also kind of matters depending on what you want to do with your yarn. If you're a western style knitter you want S twist yarn because Z twist will untwist as you work. If you're an eastern style knitter or you do crochet you want a Z twist yarn for the same reason. And if you're a weaver S or Z twist behaves basically the same but funky things can happen if you mix the two. There's a whole host of art yarn techniques which I am really not the best person to give advice on, but I'll leave a link to a book I think is great in the description. If you've ever wanted to know how to do fancy inclusions or deliberately slobby thick and thin yarn, art yarn, it's great. Then there's core spinning, which I'm just going to tell you that core spinning exists. You're going to have to do your own research on that one. And finally, I think many people at some point are like, what if I just got a raw sheep fleece? So let's talk about that for a second. A raw fleece is a pretty big undertaking. They're usually quite cheap, but they're also going to be pretty dirty. This is a combination of mud, sheep droppings and vegetable matter, the natural grease produced by a sheep's skin, which is called lanolin, and then dead skin cells, like a year's worth of dead skin cells. Also sometimes there are bugs. Basically what I'm saying is it will be very greasy, it probably has poo in it, and it's gonna smell quite bad. If you have pets they're also going to try and roll in it. My cat really wanted to get into my fleece and was not at all happy about the bath he had to have after that. This is apparently a thing, cats love lanolin. The first thing you need to do with a raw fleece is skirt it, which means get rid of all the really icky and very short bits around the edges. Then you have to make a decision about how clean you want it before you start spinning. Some people give it a very gentle clean before spinning, so there's still a lot of the lanolin in the wool. This is called spinning in the grease. I am in camp, get rid of all of that stuff right now. So I give my wool a very thorough wash before I start spinning, knowing full well that I'm still going to be picking out vegetable matter and this white stuff, which is, um, it's called yolk. It's grease and dead skin cells that have been partially cooked. Yeah. Have I mentioned this whole process is optional? You can buy pre-prepared wool fibre. Nobody will judge you. Getting the lanolin out before or after spinning takes heat and soap, but wool felts. So you have to be kind of careful. The key ingredients of felting are water, heat and agitation. So if you're using hot water and soap, for this, by the way, you don't want wool wash. You want like dish soap. You don't want to agitate the fleece too much. There's a bunch of different techniques people have come up with for this, and it's definitely something to look into if, like me, you really like the idea of the whole process start to finish. I realise that the whole process means I have to learn how to shear a sheep, which, if you're in England and you teach that, call me. Finally, I guess the question is, what do you do with the yarn that you've made? Well, anything you'd normally do with yarn. another day. I hope you've enjoyed this marathon of a video. If you like costuming, crafts, queer stuff, and live action roleplay, I hope you stick around. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me other places on the internet, and if you found this helpful, in my description you'll find a link to my Ko-fi page, where you can make a one-off or reoccurring donation to support this channel, and keep my Disney Plus subscription going while I work through an entire North Ronald Sea Fleece.
Kofi supporters get early access to all of my videos, the occasional extra sneak peek, and I couldn't do what I do without their support. And what I do right now, since the tour is on, is spin a lot of yarn. Dream big, and I'll see you next time.